Today we're in Psalms 50 and 51. Let's begin reading here in Psalm 50 at verse 1. We'll read the entire psalm and we'll get into our study tonight. And then we'll conclude with that psalm and move into Psalm 51. Beginning at verse 1 in Psalm 50, this is what is called a psalm of Asaph. Psalm 50, verse 1, The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before Him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around Him. He shall call the heavens from above and to the earth, that He may judge His people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare His righteousness, for God Himself is Judge Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not reprove you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and all the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. But to the wicked, God says, what right have you to declare my statutes or Take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction, and cast my words behind you. When you saw a thief, you consented with him, and have been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil, your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother, you slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, but I will reprove you and set them in order before your eyes." Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. This is what is called, quite obviously, a psalm of judgment. You see in this psalm that, that God is judging the wicked. And what you have really is a, a picture of a courtroom, and it's filled with witnesses as God begins to judge the whole earth. And I want you to notice that with me. In verse, uh, verse 1, when it says, The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. That's just a picture of from, uh, from uh, east to west. And He's calling all people to Himself because judgment is about to take place. So you have a picture of a courtroom. You also have a location. Verse 2 tells us where this takes place. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. So Zion is found in, in the city of Jerusalem, and this is a beautiful city as it's described here. And so you have a courtroom procedure, if you will. You have a, a location of it, and then you have the promise that God is going to judge. Verse 3, our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before Him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around Him. So he says, God is going to come and God is going to judge. And notice with me here in verse 3 how his presence is described as being accompanied by a raging fire. In Scripture, very often, fire is a picture of God's judgment. And that's the picture that we have here at this time, a picture of fiery judgment. In the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul is writing concerning God bringing judgment, if you take notes, it's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verses 7 through 10, Paul says uh, that God will give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So I want you to see that His presence is accompanied by a raging fire. And that's the picture that Paul gave to us when he speaks concerning God's judgment. Now, as I was reading this today, without going into great detail or spending a lot of time in this, 
I couldn't help but think about what recently occurred with that young Korean individual who was brutally, brutally beheaded. Now, without going into a lot of, a lot of um, detail, I was reading in the newspaper that this young man, his name is Kim, Kim Sun Il, that uh, this young man had various degrees. He had a degree in uh, languages. He could speak Arabic and Korean as well as English. Um, but he also had a degree in theology. And perhaps you read about this, that he wanted to be in uh, Saudi Arabia so that he might be able to bring the Christian gospel to the people who live there. And if he was a Christian, it doesn't say, you know, anything other than the fact that he wanted to be a missionary and share. I couldn't help but just from one pure humanity's sake, just, for be, just because we're human beings, just because, you know, I have, you know, feelings, and I see this poor guy screaming, uh, I don't want to die. And some of you saw that on, on, on television, in the news. And my heart went out to him, you know. I mean, I could have a son his age. And, and I look at this and I think, how would I as a pop feel seeing my boy in that condition. My heart just was wrenched as well as my wife and everybody else who saw that. And then today in reading the newspaper uh, concerning the fact that this is a man who wanted to bring the gospel to the Arabic speaking people, my heart was wrenched even deeper because of that. And one of the things that I have to tell you that I told my wife is I'm glad that God is judge and God will do what is right. And God is a righteous judge. May he bring peace to the family to that grieving mama and to that grieving pop that we see pictures of as they're just doing what we would do, you know, crying and their hearts are broken. But as I was thinking about that, I was reading this scripture today, our God shall come, shall not keep silent, a fire shall devour before him, it shall be very tempestuous all around him, God shall bring judgment. And uh, I, I have to tell you that I, I'm looking forward to the Lord doing, doing just that, to be honest with you. But I better be careful and move on into this psalm. Verse 4, He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. So notice he's gathering together those who claim to have relationship with him, and notice that he's making judgment. He calls heaven and earth to be witnesses as he does so. Verse 6 says, let the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. Now, when it says God himself is judge, we have greater insight in the, in the New Testament concerning this because uh, the New Testament reveals that Jesus is the judge, and Jesus being God in the flesh. If you take notes, John chapter 5, verse 22 says, the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And so the Lord is bringing judgment right now. Now, what is He judging the people about? Well, basically, He announces His charges against Israel in verses 7 through 13 and in verse 21 and, the, the, uh, and following. And the, the uh, judgment that He's bringing against uh, these people is uh, basically twofold. And if you want to write this down, I'll be giving you a uh, study on this. But I use the word formalism. Uh, ritual religion, and secondly, hypocrisy. That's what he's speaking about as he brings judgment. Ritual religion, you know, just going through the motions. We call that nominal Christianity today. Somebody is calling himself a Christian uh, because he was water baptized or went to church as a child or, or has never declared himself to be anything else, but, but aren't born again. And so what he's really dealing with is the religion of the people at that time that had basically become just a ritualism, and also he's dealing with the uh, hypocrisy of the people, and we'll see that in some detail as we look at this. I want you to notice with me that he is saying, I'm not upset at your meticulous keeping of the law. He's pointing out that they offer sacrifices even as he's commanded them to do through the law of Moses. In verse 7, hear, O my people, I will speak, O Israel, I will testify against you, I am your God. I'm not going to reprove you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which, you continue, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world is mine in all its fullness. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? What he's speaking about is, I'm not opposing the fact that you have offerings that you are offering. The fact is that you are. The problem is, is you don't understand that. It's simply a ritual to you, he's saying. You have no genuine faith attached to the action. 
Some might say, well, why is God so upset about this? I mean, these people are obviously going to temple and making sacrifice. They come and they even say that they're serving Him. Why would God be so upset? We could bring that up into the 21st century, and, and it's kind of like people coming weekly to church. They show up for midweek studies. They, they serve and do a variety of things. Why would God be upset with that? Isn't that a good thing? Shouldn't everybody go to church? Shouldn't everybody be involved and active? Shouldn't they serve? What's wrong with that? Why would God be so upset? God is pointing out that they bring their sacrifices. God is pointing out that they do that in a regular way. They come to temple. They worship. They serve. You know, they're there all the time when the doors are open. What's the problem here? Well, all the activity that they're doing does not reveal a genuine relationship with God whatsoever. In the New Testament book of Revelation, in chapter 2, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to the church of Ephesus. And when he's bringing a, a word of condemnation to that particular church there in, in Ephesus, in modern Turkey on the western coast, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, this is what Jesus Christ says to the church. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience, have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, he said, I have this against you. You have left your first love. You are doing things out of religious uh, habit. You're, you're going and doing all of these things, but your heart is no longer on fire for me. That's a great danger, guys. It really is. God is saying, you come and you make the sacrifice to these people. He says, you've done that, but your religion is formal. Your religion is basically ritual. It's on the outside, but you don't have a real heart faith relationship with me. The more I think about this, the more I encounter this thought in our society, the more I'm becoming aware of the fact that there are so many thousands of people who honestly believe that they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ because they are religious people. I was watching the funeral services recently of Ronald Reagan, and in doing so, I heard some comments being made by an individual who has had never any evidence that he's ever had a relationship with Jesus Christ, and yet he's speaking religiously about faith and how it should be expressed. And I'm watching this person speak, and I'm absolutely just once again amazed that we can deceive ourselves so easily into believing that we actually have a, a true saving knowledge of Christ just because we can say his name, just because we, we can say, well, I was reading the Bible or I go to church. And that's what the Lord is talking about. He's saying, you have a ritual relationship with me. You go to temple, you make the offerings. Uh, with your lips, you profess faith, but your heart is far from me. And for this, he says, I will bring judgment on you. When he says in verses 10 through 13, every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills, he's saying, do you think you're giving me something in all of these offerings? Perhaps you've forgotten you only give me what already belongs to me. It's kind of like on Father's Day when, when, when my kids were real small and there were babies and everything and, and they'd go out shopping for dad and they'd want to get me something and I appreciated it and I still do that they wanted to go out and buy me something but they didn't have a job. Where were they getting the money? You know what I'm saying? Where were they getting the money? Oh, Dad, I wish I had more money. I'd have gotten you something better. No, I gave you enough. I mean, that was my money you're buying me something with. You know, and that's the truth, isn't it? I mean, that's the truth of the matter. I mean, they only buy you something with the money you gave them to go out and buy you something with. And that's how it is with the Lord. Anything I do to Him or for Him, anything I give to Him, He first gave to me. I'm only giving back to Him what He first gave to me. A lot of people don't understand that. God is saying, are you giving me something that I didn't give to you in the first place? Do you think you created those bulls? Do you think you created, you know, those, those sheep? Do you think that the grain offerings came from the work of your own hand? Don't you understand? All of this comes from my hand. I own it all. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And here you are thinking you're giving to me something. I already own it. It already belongs to me. Your heart is far from me. Do you think that pleases me? And he's saying to them, it doesn't. That's not what I'm asking for, you see. 
what, what my kids give to me that I think is of the greatest value is their love. How about you, Mama? How about you, Dad? The, the greatest gift my child gives to me isn't anything other than their love. This shirt that I'm wearing right now, just got it. My, my, my daughter, Anna, bought it for me for Father's Day. And I'm grateful for it. These shoes here, My son Dave gave, Dave gave them to me. He said, Dad, you wear white shoes, and you look really dumb in them, and so you ought to get something with color. So, and you know what? I appreciate it. I really do. <laughs> Marie bought me these Levi's. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, they don't like the way I dress, but I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the fact that they did that. I do, I really do. I appreciate the fact that they took time to go out and shop for Papa, and I love them for it. But the gifts didn't matter. What matters is their love for me. I had a great Father's Day gift today. My daughter, Anna, took me out for lunch. And I'm sitting there at a, at a table with my baby, you know, and I'm eating a salad and some soup. And you know what? The salad and the soup, she said, it's on me, Dad. You know, I said, cool, you know, <laughs> make that a habit. But you know, I appreciate it. I appreciated that. But you know what I appreciate more is sitting across the table from my baby and spending an hour just talking to her, just fellowshipping with her, just enjoying that time. You know, you know what I'm talking about. See, God doesn't want me to go and say, well, Lord, I gave you 20 bucks. Isn't that enough? He doesn't want that. He says, no, that's not enough. I don't need your money. I gave you the money in the first place, and you ripped me off by giving me 20. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is just to sit across a table, if you will, and look eye to eye and fellowship because you love me. That's the offering that I want. I don't want your things. I want your heart. Because when I have your heart, I get everything else. So I want your heart. And so that's what he's speaking about here. May we as a church, may we as Christians think about that. Because sometimes we can try and bribe God, you know, pay him off by trying to do good things for him. And we get real busy trying to do good things for God. And God says, you know, all these good things that you're doing, you know, um, where's your heart? What I really want is fellowship with you. And, and that's what the Lord is speaking about here. In Jeremiah, in chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, uh, the Lord God said, I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. This is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice. I will be your God. You shall be my people. And walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. Obey me. Have a relationship with me. Be, be hungry to hear me as I speak to you. Now, in verse four, uh, 14 and 15, he says, Offer to God thanksgiving. Pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. So make your offerings to me, but make your offerings to me from a heart of love and trust, not in a ritualistic way. I want you to notice when he speaks here, and he says, Offer to, uh, offer to God thanksgiving. Pay your vows. Uh, Thanksgiving is not simply just praise, but in the Jewish religion, they had what they called the thank offering. And he also has the vow here. And, and, and just upon reading this, you might not notice this. He had the thank offering and he had the vow offering. And both of those are here in this phrase when he says, offer thanksgiving and pay your vows. And what that is saying, guys, is that these are voluntary offerings. Thank offerings and, and, uh, and vows are voluntary offerings. That's the point he's making. He's saying in the law, you have requirements that you need to make certain offerings. Those are required of you. But you also have options. You have voluntary things that you can do. So demonstrating your love for me is to do those voluntary things, not the things that are simply required of you. And so he's saying in doing the voluntary things, you're revealing your heart for me. 
In doing the things, going the extra mile, you're actually showing that you, you actually really do have a relationship with me, and this is what I call, call you to do, and this is what I, I want from you. I want your love. Now, the second charge of hypocrisy is found beginning in verse 16, where he says, to the wicked, God says, what right have you to declare my statutes or, or take my covenant in your mouth, seeing you hate instruction, cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him and have been a, a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil, your tongue frames deceit. You, you sit and speak against your brother. You slander your, your own mother's son. These things you have done. And I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you. But I will reprove you and set them in order before your eyes. And so this is the second charge, which is hypocrisy. You're quoting Scripture. You're claiming to be a believer, but you're not practicing what you have said. You're like a thief. You're an adulterer. You're a slanderer. You're a gossip, and you divide. And in all of this, you take my patience as approval. You think because I haven't responded immediately to what you've done, that I'm like you. That's what he's saying here when he says that. In verse 21, these things you have done and I kept silent, you thought that I was altogether like you. You think because I haven't moved quickly on this and dealt with you immediately that I must approve of it. God's patience is a wonderful thing. It really is. Aren't you glad that God was patient with you? Aren't you? I, oh, I am. The Lord has been patient with me all of my life. And I am grateful that he is long-suffering to me. I am so grateful that the first time I lied that all of a sudden a giant boot from heaven didn't come out and squash me like a bug. I am so grateful for the first time that I stole, he didn't just cut me off. You know, I thank God that he didn't move, but he actually has patience. He's saying, you are misunderstanding my patience towards you as approval. See, sometimes people will do something wrong and it bothers them, but there's no quick response from heaven. They think they got away with it, so they do that again and something else. And they keep moving into more and more sin, thinking that God must approve of this because God is a gracious and loving God, and, and He shows mercy on me, and He knows that I am weak. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't go into all the stories that I could share with you about people who have taken God's uh, slowness to react to them as being approval to their sin. I, I know, for example, of, of a pastor who was robbing the offerings to purchase his drugs so that he could do his drugs uh, before he'd go out and preach, and he did it for some time, and when finally it was discovered and it was confronted, he said, well, you know what, after, after you know, shooting heroin and, and going up into the, into the pulpit, I had a greater sense of God's grace and anointing in my life because I knew that I was a sinner and, and God was being merciful to me and I could preach as a sinner to sinners. That was his rationale. There are people like that, guys. There are people in pulpits like that. There are people in pews who think that way. It's okay for me to do what I'm doing because God has not stopped it. You know, I prayed and said, God, if this is wrong, please, uh, when I go to her house tonight and I know what I'm intending to do, may she not be home. And then I show up and she's there and I spend the night. But, but God could have stopped that, you see, but he didn't. He gave me approval. And anyway, you, you say it's a sin and the Bible says it's wrong, but, but doesn't the Bible say God is love and God is forgiving and God is merciful? And they take God's not moving immediately to deal with them as his approval. It happens all the time. I remember a story came out of the Middle Ages. There was a, a system within the Catholic Church called indulgences. Perhaps some of you know what the indulgences were and, and what it means and all. And, and Martin Luther had a real problem with that. And that's part of what, what caused the Reformation to occur is the sale of what are called indulgences and all. And, and basically it was like... Um, a get out of hell card. I mean, if you pay enough money, you're going to get out of purgatory quicker and all of that. And so uh, people were selling indulgences and all. And there's a story of a priest who was, was uh, on his way somewhere, and a, a man stops him as this priest is on his way and says to him, uh, I, I need to purchase an indulgence. And the priest says, uh, fine, my son. He says, but, he said, uh, the guy who wants to purchase the indulgence says to him, but it's for a sin that I have yet to commit. 
And the priest says, no, you can't do that. You know, if you've committed a sin, you can purchase indulgences and we can pray, but we can't sell you for your know, indulgence for something you have yet to do. And he says, no, I'm going to do it, Father. He says, I'm going to do it. And, and there's nothing going to stop me from doing it, but I really want an indulgence. If I give you a lot of money, will you give me the indulgence? And the priest thinks for a while, and he says, well, okay. So the guy gives him money, the priest gives him an indulgence, and then the man who gave the priest the money, well, he robs the priest of all the money he has and leaves. That was what he was planning on doing, so he kind of got forgiven before he did it. I mean, think about that. But there are a lot of people who honestly think kind of like that that it's okay to do this because God is a God of grace. And the Lord is saying, no, he's saying that's not how it works. You're misunderstanding me. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Paul said this. He said, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Don't you understand that God is being good to you and that that should give you space to repent? Don't you understand that yet? Well, obviously they hadn't. And so the Lord says, you're, you're being hypocritical. You actually, well, like he says in verse 8, well, verse uh, 16, I want to, uh, 17 rather, I want to see that with you for a moment. When he says, seeing you hate instruction, you cast my words behind you. What right do you have to declare my words, seeing that, that you haven't even applied it to your own life, is what he's saying. What right do I have if I'm out there drinking and drinking to excess and getting a little bit high. What right do I have to go and speak to somebody and say to them, hey, you know what, you shouldn't drink because God gives the Holy Spirit and, and, and new wine and you're still drinking the old wine. And, and what right would I have if I'm continuing to indulge in sin and try and, and, and lead somebody to the right way? That's the point he's making. He says, you don't put into practice my word. You actually throw it behind you. You don't even believe it. And that's why he says in verse 18, you saw a thief and consented with him. You've been a partaker with adulterers. You give your mouth to evil. Your tongue, to, your tongue frames deceit. You, you sit and speak against your brother. And so bottom line is, he says, you're living in a way that you ought, ought not to. You're a thief, you're an adulterer, you're a slanderer, you're a gossip, and you divide. And all of this, he says, is wrong. Verse 22, now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. Though I am promising you judgment, I am giving you an opportunity to get out. But if you do not repent, I will judge you. If you repent, then I will save you. So, it's up to you. Verse 51, uh, rather chapter 51 or Psalm 51, beginning at verse 1. This is a psalm of David, and this is a psalm that relates to a confession of sin as well as forgiveness. This is a uh, psalm that was written by, by King David after he had uh, committed sin in that very famous sin with Bathsheba. Beginning at verse 1, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. and Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips. My mouth shall show forth your praise. 
For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offerings. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar." It's a psalm where he is crying out for mercy. It's a psalm that occurred after David had sinned with Bathsheba. And he's saying, God, I have committed a terrible sin, and I need your help, and I need you to forgive me. I have committed the sin of adultery in that I took another man's wife. I have committed the sin of murder in that I sent her husband to the front lines, and he died. I have also been a liar because I've tried to cover it up in a deceitful fashion. And Lord, this is a sin that, that I am aware of, that you have made me very clearly cognizant of, and I need your help. And this is what he's speaking about. And as we look at this particular psalm, I can't help but understand some of what he's saying, because as a, as a person, I've gone through things where, where I've had to cry out, to the Lord, for the same. Now, as we begin, I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice that he uses various words to describe what we normally speak of as, as simply sin. He, he uses the word transgressions. In verse 1, where he says, blot out my transgressions. The word transgressions speaks of rebellion against God. It speaks of, of crossing the line or crossing God's boundary. When he speaks concerning sin, he also uses the word iniquity. When he says in verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. The word iniquity speaks of that which is bent or twisted. It's something that cannot be explained away. It's something that can't be excused. We live in a time that people are constantly explaining away their sin. We live in a time where people cannot understand how, how there are others out there in the society who disapprove of the things that they're doing and wonder what gives you the right to make judgments on them. I'm reading a book right now without going into any detail because, frankly, it's not written by a Christian. It's written by some secular individual, but the question that they have in the book is, what happened to morality? And, and they're actually writing from a, an interesting perspective, arguing for, for morals, arguing and saying that the society that we live in today is perverse, is iniquitous, it's twisted. And that's the argument and uses as an, as an example something that took place in, in an art school in San Francisco where, uh, uh, where, which is funded by tax dollars where a student uh, did something that I can't even tell you. I mean, in mixed company. I, and I wouldn't even, even if it was just me and another guy, I'd feel uncomfortable explaining. I'd say you need to read what had happened. But it is so coarse and so gross and it occurs within a classroom situation where the, where the student who, who does this particular thing as an art, expression of art, begins to say, how can people be so upset at what I've done? It's just that you don't like homosexuals because he's a gay student. But in reality, what he did was extremely disgusting. He did it with another student. He did it in class, and he got graded for it. And tax dollars are basically paying for this kind of thing. But he has no clue as to why people would say, I don't want my tax dollars funding things like that. We're living in a society right now that is truly twisted, that really doesn't know their right hand from their left, that doesn't know good from bad. And, and I have to be careful not to go into this very much because it's kind of what I've been thinking about lately in terms of this society that we're trying to minister to, that it is extremely lost. I mean, it's really lost. Um, we live in a time when when a young lady who sleeps with uh, three or four guys is still considering herself fairly pure because she has friends who have slept with 50 guys. You know, so from her perspective, you know, I'm almost a virgin because my friend sleeps around with all... And I've heard that argument. I, I've heard that argument. You can't imagine the, the things that I've heard when I've spoken to young people and, and they've been sharing and asking for prayer and then explaining what they've been up to. And then I'll ask them, don't you understand that what you're doing is wrong? Well, what makes that wrong? I mean, all my friends do that and I'm fairly conservative. Um, in relation to my friends. I mean, you're saying that what I'm doing with this guy, I met him a week ago, isn't that long enough so that we can be doing the things that we're doing and all? And I'm telling you, we're living, and you know this, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We're living in a time where, where morality is so twisted and perverse. Well, that's what the word iniquity means. It's twisted and bent. He said, what I did was perverse. What I did was twisted. I actually was on my roof 
And I should have been with my troops who were out there in a time of war. This is what David is saying. And as I was walking on my roof and I was just taking in the, uh, you know, the, the view and all, I, I looked down because I'm king. I live on the top of the hill. I'm king of the mountain. My house is on the top. And everybody who's less than me build their houses lower than me. When you go to Israel, you'll see that they have what they call David's citadel, and you go into the city of Jerusalem, and you see his house is built on a hill. And everything else is built below me. He says, so I was there walking. I was taking in the, the, the breeze and all, enjoying myself. I looked down. As I looked down, there's this beautiful young woman. Her name is Bathsheba. She's bathing. And I, I stood there. I, I noticed her doing that. Now, I could have gone into the house. I, I could have said, oh, that's Uriah's uh, wife. And it's improper for me to be looking at her. After all, I'm the king. I could have any woman I want. She belongs to another man in marriage. And and he says, but no, instead of doing that, I, I looked at her and I inquired of her and I said, who is this? And they said, well, that's Uriah the Hittite's wife, that's Bathsheba. And I, and I said, bring her to me. And so she came in. She said, I've made my vows, uh, offerings. In other words, uh, I'm cleansed from my impurity. I could be fertile. She gave me a warning, but I didn't care. I slept with her. And as I did so, I get a note later on. You know what? I'm with child. Instead of dealing with it the way that I should have, I called Uriah in from the, from the field. I, I sat down with him. I encouraged him to, uh, to go home and to be with his wife, and, and he wouldn't do it. He ended up sleeping in the guardhouse. I tried to get him to go and slept in the gate. He wouldn't go home. And because he wouldn't go home, what I chose to do as well was the, the thing that I had to do. His wife is pregnant. It obviously wasn't with him. He's been out in the field as a loyal man. And so I had him go closest to where the battle was the hottest. And I, and I had my troops withdraw, and, and someone killed him there on the battlefield. And now I'm free to take Bathsheba. That's what I did. Tried to cover it up. I had the husband murdered, and I committed adultery with her. I'm twisted. That's what he's saying. No excuse offered. He didn't say it's the way I was raised. I didn't have advantages. I mean, when you're a, a young boy and you're in a poor family and, and you've got to go out in the field and watch these stinking sheep, I just didn't have any advantages. Now I've got all of this money. I've got all of this power, you know, and I can use it any way I want. I did it because I could. And he says it was twisted. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. The word sin is uh, in the Pentecost. Pentateuch, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Old Testament being written in Hebrew, the word sin is, is uh, the Greek word that means missing the mark. And this is how, how sin is referred to. Transgression, which is rebellion or crossing the line. Iniquity is that which is twisted or bent. It's something that can't be excused or explained away. And sin is missing the mark and speaks of imperfection. I want you to see this, though. I want you to see that the way for you to get cleansed is to offer no excuse. He is not trying to say anything that makes him look better before God. That is some of the problems that sometimes we might have when we come before the Lord is we try and excuse ourselves. But he's not saying that, guys. He's not saying, I tried hard and I just missed. He's just saying, this is what I am. I crossed the boundary, I am twisted, and I have missed the mark. And God, I need you. In verse 3, he says, I acknowledge my transgression. This is a confession. I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. There are things that perhaps you've done in the past that you remember. It, it doesn't seem to leave you. I mean, it's, you might be just driving in the car, turn on the radio, and bang, it's back. My sin is ever before me. You might wake up in the morning, and you might still be regretting something that you'd done in the past. How could I have done that? My sin is ever before me. It doesn't go away from me. You know, I close my eyes, and I can almost see exactly what I did, and, and that's what he's saying. I acknowledge my transgressions, my sins ever before. I need your help against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. I am guilty. I did it. I'm suffering what I deserve. There's nothing wrong in what you have done. I am the one who did it. I am completely wrong, and you are completely just in judging me for it. Genesis 18, 25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Psalm 7, verse 11 says, God is a just judge. And that's all he's doing. He's agreeing with God. Now, when he says, I acknowledge my transgressions, I speak of confession. The idea of confession in the New Testament is simply to agree with God. God says this is wrong, and you agree with him. You say the same thing. Homo legeo simply means to say the same thing. If I confess my sin, 
the word confess, homologeo, if I agree with God that he is right. That's where a lot of problem have the, a lot of people have the problems, though. They don't want to agree that God is right. They want to say, I did it, but, you know, in the court, I used to go to, the, to court once in a while, and uh, in traffic, I got five moving violations between my 16th and 18th birthdays, five tickets, and you'd go before the judge there, and you'd say, guilty with an explanation. Anybody ever say that? Guilty with an explanation. And the judge would say, what's your explanation? Then you create some lie and hope you get away with it. Guilty with an explanation. He's not doing that. He's saying, I have done this. And that's how it works, guys. If you want to get right with the Lord, don't try and say guilty with an explanation. Just say, I am guilty. He goes on into verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. From my conception, I have possessed a sin nature. I have the propensity to sin, and I have struggled with sin from the time I was born. There has never been any time in my life that I have ever been without the taint of sin because sin permeates my entire existence. I cannot say that I have made my heart clean. I cannot say that I am pure from my sin. I have to admit that I am a sinner by nature. I asked my teacher in Biola in my doctrines class, I asked him this simple question. I said, may I ask you this question? Am I a sinner because I sin? Or do I sin because I'm a sinner? And that may sound like a matter of semantics, but it's not. It's good theology. Do I become a sinner once I have sinned? Or am I a sinner just looking for a place to express sin? The Bible says I'm a sinner looking for a place to express it. I am a sin looking for an opportunity to happen. That's what he's saying. I was conceived altogether in sin. I have a sin nature and a propensity towards it because that's all that can come out of me as a sinner. And so he's agreeing with the Lord. And in verse 6, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. If you do not reveal yourself and your truth to me, then I will never find it on my own. You reveal truth in the inward parts. You're the one who, who causes truth to settle into me. You're the one who reveals it, and you're the one who illumines me to understand it. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Now, when he says, purge me with hyssop, um, a branch from the hyssop tree would be used to sprinkle blood on the sacrificial altar. And so when he says, purge me with hyssop, it's a way of symbolizing dealing with sin, and the way that you deal with sin is through the shedding of blood. That's the point he's making here. Now, we know that in this picture in the Old Testament, there were blood of bulls and goats, but they never really were able to wash you clean of sin. It was required of the Lord to send his own son, Jesus Christ, to one time for all time shed his blood on that cross for us. And when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible teaches that he shed all of his blood, and his blood covers us. His blood is what is used by the Lord as currency in heaven. Jesus Christ is the one who saved us by the shedding of his blood. Ephesians 1, 7 says that in Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And so he's saying you need to deal with my sin and it's going to occur through blood and bring joy in my heart once that that has occurred so that I might once again rejoice in you. You have broken me, but bring me to the place of, of joy once again. And that will happen when you hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. I will not have joy until the sin question has been dealt with. Create in me, verse 10, a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, I want you to notice what he's saying. He didn't say reform me. He didn't say renovate me. He said recreate me. I don't need renovation. I don't need reformation. What I need is recreation. I need to become brand new. That's what I need. 
I need to become something that is different. That's called regeneration in the New Testament. That is what it means to be in Christ. And the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, when I became a Christian, I didn't become a reformed alcoholic or reformed druggie. I was recreated. And so I don't say, well, you know, I am 33 years sober. What I can say is, I came to Christ, and He gave me a new thirst. I came to Jesus, and He gave me a new hunger. I came to Jesus, and He gave me a new heart. He didn't simply give me a new beginning. He recreated me, and He created me in His image. That's called being born again. And David is saying that, create in me a clean heart. I don't want a reformed or washed heart alone. I want a brand new heart. I want a brand new life. And that comes through you. And I need your spirit within me. I don't want to be cast away from your presence. I want the Holy Spirit to reside within me. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 3.16, that we are the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in us. So, we didn't become religious when we answered the invitation. We were born again. And we didn't just get a new lease on life, a new chance. We received power from God to live for Him. And we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit residing within us to give us the strength and ability to live for Him. And sometimes we may quench His Spirit, and sometimes we may grieve His Spirit, but he says to us, don't be doing that. Just allow the Spirit to work in you, and I will set you free. And so he's saying, this is what I need. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. Sinners will be converted to you. Lord, I need your Spirit in my life. I need your joy because my heart has been broken by my sin. And when the joy of your salvation is once again experienced, I will be your witness. And this experience will be used to glorify the depth of your mercy to sinners. Because I can go, in verse 13, and teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. When I become that living testimony to the depth of your love and, the, and how boundless your mercy is. Because people know that I have done wrong. But when they see the joy of forgiveness in my life, I'll be a wonderful testimony. And so, Lord, I'm asking that you would do that. Listen, when God works in your heart, you become a wonderful testimony of His grace. When I got saved, briefly, when I got saved, when I became a Christian, December 27th, 1970, when I, at the age of 20, heard the gospel message for the first time in a very clear way and responded to it, the very first thing I started doing, and it was natural, the very first thing I started doing was sharing about what God had done in my life. I shared with my sister Madeline, who was four years younger than I. She was 16, and, I, and she came to Christ that night. Within a couple of weeks, I, I shared with my mom and my dad, and two or three weeks down the road after getting saved, they came to Christ. I began sharing with my friends. I began having prayer meetings at my house, and my life was radically transformed at the age of 20. And so people knew me, and they would say, what happened to him? And, and, and what had happened was I hadn't been reformed. I hadn't been, you know, renovated. I had been reborn. And they saw that in me. They saw what happened. And that joy of being restored into a relationship with God because I had been lost. Well, then I could share with transgressors, and I could say, you know what kind of radical life I lived? You know what kind of person I was, how crazy I was, how, how into the things that I was in. You were there. You saw. You know what kind of person I was. How I would walk into a store and I would take clothing off of a rack and just walk out with it in my hands and rip them off. How I would pull up to the gas pump and fill my car with gas and drive away without pain. You saw the things I used to do, and I'd walk into the liquor stores and pick up the half gallons of Seagram's and walk out, or when I picked up the case of beer and I wouldn't put it in my car and went out and drank. You saw the things that I used to do, how crazy I was. When I rifled through that person's purse and found some drugs that I didn't know and just dropped them to see what they would do to me, you saw 
the things that I would do and how God has changed my life. And now I can tell transgressors that God gives you joy and God gives you peace and God gives you forgiveness and God gives you a brand new life that even your mom and your dad will blow their minds over and say, what happened to my son or my daughter? I got somebody entirely new living in this house. And that's what David is talking about. And I need your spirit. Verse 14, deliver me from your blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips. My mouth shall show forth your praise. For, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I'd give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. I cannot experience the joy of salvation by religious ritual or by trying to buy you off. You require sincere repentance in order for a sinner to be forgiven. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. I cannot say that the day that I got saved that I cried because I didn't. I didn't cry. I wasn't one of those who came forward and wept. I, I didn't do that. As a matter of fact, they didn't even have what you call an altar call. They just said, stand to your feet wherever you are. There were 4,000 of us in this room, and they weren't calling us to weave our way through and come up and pray with somebody. He just said, stand up if you need Jesus Christ. And out of 4,000 people, a handful of us, 10 or 12, stood up. Out of 4,000, 10 or 12 of us stood up. I was one of those who did. And I wasn't crying. I felt like, I felt like the weight of the world had been rolled off of my shoulders. I felt such a joy. I felt like, I thought, man, Something just happened to me that I have never felt in my life before. I don't feel dirty anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't feel guilty anymore. I don't feel weighed down. I don't feel depressed anymore. I don't feel lonely anymore. I feel like I'm brand new. And it was in that spirit that I came home and shared with my parents. And when I walked into the door and they were in the den with Madeline, my sister, and I walked in and I stood at the doorway of the den and the lights were all turned off as mom and dad and Madeline were there watching some movie, you know, on TV. And I stood at the door and I said, Mom, Dad, Madeline. And they looked at me like, uh-oh, oh, what's he on? Because I was usually loaded. And they looked at me and I said, I love you. Oh, <laughs> man. Mom freaks. My mom freaks. And she goes and does a rosary for me because she thought that I had absolutely gone off the deep end. And I can still remember my dad leading her past the bathroom where I was, patting her on the back, and she was shaking her head, and she did a rosary. She was so afraid that I had finally snapped. And there I was, clear for the first time. Clear. And my, my disposition radically transformed from that day. Absolutely. And all it required was for me to say, God, I know that you're not, you're not, you can't be bribed. You know, the sacrifices are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These you will not reject. And God, that's what I have. I am sorry for what I did to my mom and my dad. I'm sorry for the way I treated my sisters. I'm sorry for how I treated my friends and girlfriends. I'm sorry how I've been in society. Lord, I am sorry about who I am, but I'm especially sorry because I finally realized it was against you that I sinned and did these things. And God, forgive me, a sinner, because I have a broken heart. And God says, that's all that's required of you. Now I'll heal it because Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And so what happens is you cast your cares on him and God receives you. Finally, in verse 18 and 19, do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offering. And then they shall offer bulls on your altars. And he kind of closes, if you will, with a prayer for, for the people there in, in Jerusalem. And it's like he's saying, God, 
Just strengthen the moral fiber of the people. Keep them from failing as I have failed. And may they have genuine faith in you. In that way, you will be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness. With burnt offering and whole burnt offering, they shall offer bulls on your altar. May they be sincere and protect them from the sins that I have found myself to be so guilty of. 